Welcome to the Tenkara Angler Level Line Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Agnetta, and in this episode, I called up a few of my friends, and we're going to tell some fish stories. So who doesn't like a good fish story? After all, Tenkara Angler was founded as a forum for the Tenkara and fixed line community to be able to tell their stories to a wider audience. I was actually listening to a podcast the other day about turkey hunting of all things. And while I'm not a hunter, the host who had five of his friends tell their most memorable turkey hunts was wildly entertaining. I thought that concept could apply itself well to Tenkara Fishing and the Tenkara Angler Level Line podcast. So I reached out to five of my friends to ask them about their most memorable fish stories. And when I say memorable, they're not always the biggest or the smallest or the first. They're just fish stories that are memorable to them in a certain way. It's stories that you're not going to want to miss, so make sure that you stay tuned. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to my first guest, from the Midwest, who's going to tell his memorable fish story. Hi, this is Jared Wilson, and I fish Tinkara. I've been fishing Tinkara probably for about four years now, started in around 2020. And I was recording a whole bunch, and I was like, wow, I have some decent footage here. Maybe I'll start a YouTube channel. So I started a YouTube channel called Tinkara Genki. So check it out if you'd like. Uh, my, my most memorable probably fish story is my first fish I ever caught. So I was fishing in probably 2020. I started fishing and I had a lot of time to fish and man, was I bad. I had a uh, <clears throat> Kodomo eight foot rod and it comes with a 12 foot uh, leader or Tenkara line and it is like floating line. So it's terrible. You have 12 feet of that on an eight foot rod and then I didn't know what I was doing. So I put on probably, probably about six feet of tippet and so I was whipping it around quite a bit, was fishing for probably three months, saw tons of fish, tons of fish rising, but I kept on losing fish, couldn't land one. And all of a sudden, you know, when I was going, putting it right on there, eventually I got good at my terrible setup, <laughs> figured out how to do it, putting the fly right where it should be, and then nothing. They, they would, the fly or the fish would take it and would pull it right off. So clearly I was doing something wrong. Went to my local Orvis store, Madison, Wisconsin, and um, was was asking them, what am I doing wrong? And they were like, well, are you wetting the fly? You know, when you tie it? Clearly I wasn't doing that. So lost, lost a ton there, lost a ton of flies too. So went back, did that, um, and was fishing. And man, uh, was on, some uh fish that were just coming up rising so i put it right on them and sure enough i hooked into one and man my heart was racing got all excited i was like ooh, ooh i almost fell on the creek because i was on a deep part of the edge of the the creek and so i just got excited was losing my footing and it was probably the worst uh netting i've ever had and man i'm i was terrible at it but so excited heart pounding and like, but nothing else mattered in that moment. And I eventually finally landed these 12 inch um, brown trout. And man, it was the beautiful, most beautiful trout I've ever seen. Still to this day, even though there's brookies, um, I've caught tons of fish, man. This is, it was the most exciting thing, um, you know, for fishing. Felt like I was a kid again, you know, just fishing with my grandpa or something. And, you know, it, it was awesome, awesome time. So my first fish was my most memorable moment of Tenkara fishing. What a great story from Jared. Everybody's been there. You get your first Tenkara rod. You're not exactly sure what to do with it. You kind of flail around and you're just very, very nervous until you get that first fish. But what a relief when you do. I can see why that fish and that story's so memorable to him. Well, our next guest is also from the Driftless area, although a little bit south in Iowa. And he's got a story that's decidedly different from the first one that we just heard. Hi, my name's Dre. Uh, I run a little Facebook group called New School Tenkara. I've been fishing Tenkara for about seven or eight years now. And uh, this is my fish story. It happened in the Iowa Driftless. 
Uh, I was with my buddy, uh, who I will refer to as Kirby, because that's his actual name. And him and I, uh, whenever we go out fishing, we work in the fly shop together. And we always try to find some weird pocket water. So in Iowa, the landowner owns the stream bottom. So you, there's all these like kind of like chunks of public and private that you can kind of navigate. Always, we're always trying to navigate to find kind of new water. Um, so it's mid-August. It's, I mean, if you've ever been in the Midwest in the late summer and you see a cornfield run because it is the most humid place on the planet, you can literally hear the corn growing. And um, so it's mid-August. Uh, we're, we're trying to fish a, basically a confluence of a smaller pr- uh, spring creek that feeds into a larger river. And we're hiking down there. It's like 80 degrees. We've got, I've got shorts on. And also too, like, I'm not a skinny guy. Like the heat is not my friend. Um, So we're hiking through this cornfield and I am just sweating. I mean, like, like profusely sweating and like getting dizzy. And my buddy, he's like 20 something. I'm almost 50. And he's looking at me going like, man, I don't know. Do you like want to hike back up? Cause I don't think this is going to fly. And I'm like, you know, we're kind of at this point of no return where it's actually like the relief is there. I can see the water, you know? And I'm like, no man, let's just like keep going. So we get to where we think we're going to go. We get to the edge, we pop out of this cornfield and there's like a six foot mud bank sliding down to this raw, to this Creek that we're trying to fish. Like maybe, I don't know, like 20 feet upstream from the main river. And like I'm like dying. So I literally took off my pack and chucked it in some weeds, slid down the bank and fell face first into the water and like completely submerged myself and sat there for like, I mean, I don't know, like five minutes, like up to my neck in this like. I also, too, I forgot it rained like a couple inches the night before. So when I say we were having a high water event, what I really mean is like the water was completely chocolate milk. It was garbage. (laughs) It was completely garbage. Like I put my hand in the water. I had maybe like an inch of visibility, if that. So we're, so I get down there, I cool off. He's looking at me and he's like, well, man, we're down here. Like I can't hike out right now. We're soaking, like trying to like wash off the, the nettles the you know the stinging nettle from our bodies you know i mean it's just like a a catastrophe like kind of you know so i get up and i'm really tired and i kind of put myself back together and he sort of like and we're and we kind of look up and you know this muddy little stream is like turn after turn after turn of like if the water was pristine it would be if the water was clean it would have been like like a fantasy for trout it was like incredible you know what i mean so i'm behind him and i'm kind of trying to catch my breath and we go around this one turn and we're just like we're fishing there's two pools and we're fishing like we fished the first pool and it looks so good it's like this big wide pool that has like a really defined kind of current seam through it with like some structure in the back and i'm like and we're both i mean he guides i guide like both western and tankara like we know the area, we know the fishery and we're not getting anything. Like, I think he caught like a Creek chub or something like that was it. And I was like, huh, that's just weird. Like, how is there not any fish in here? So in between that first pool, that was nothing. There was an even better pool with about 20, 20 yards of sort of like flat meh looking water, you know, moving in between it. And I was like, all right, man, well, you know, you've kind of put up with me, you know, bitching and moaning this whole time. Like, just take the head of that pool, man, and just get in there. Because he was kind of on the hunt for a bigger fish, you know. And I was in the back, and I'm fishing this little slot, you know. Oh, also, I'm fishing, um, for the first time ever, uh, a 6'4 rod, which technically probably a 7'3", as you've already kind of gone through but like i was fishing ruben samurai (laughs) so he um so i'm fishing that rod for like the first time 
I have two other rods in my bag, but that happens to be the one I in my bag. That happens to be the one I grab. I pull it out. I un I unfurl it, and it's got like this blue line on it that I cannot see at all that I've been meaning to change for like a month. I just like, I can't see it like at all. Like I can't see it in the air. I can't see it when it hits the water. I can't see it if I lay it all in the water. So I've got this line, I you know, and I have this fly on that I tie that actually, since I've realized that it's actually Umqua also ties it, but I kind of came across it sort of independently of them, but it's basically a jig worm. I mean, it's a, it's a jig squirmy. It's, it's junk fly. You know what I mean? And everybody laughs at me because I just, I fish it all the time because it's like incredibly fishy. <laughs> and, um, and my answer is always like all fish eat worms, dude. So like, I'm just going to keep fishing this thing until like the fish don't eat it. And then I'll fish something else, you know? So I'm sitting behind him. He's up there fishing in this pool, you know, he's roll casting and reach casting because he's a Western dude, you know, and he's doing all these finagling, try to like get this thing going. He puts on an indicator. I mean, he, like every runs a streamer through this pool. I mean, he's just like changing flies left and right. And I'm just kind of sitting behind him in a stupor, just like lazily kind of like just flopping this, you know, flopping my fly in the water going like, man, if I could just come out of this with like a stocked rainbow, like I'd be super sweet. Let me just grab my picture for the gram and like you know, get out of here, you know? So I'm sitting there and I'm kind of like, I'm bouncing this fly along the bottom and I can't see anything. And I'm kind of halfway delirious. And my, my line just like kind of goes tight a little bit. And I was like, Oh man, I thought I snagged, you know? So I kind of like set like half-heartedly and it, nothing happened. It just, you know, my line bent over and I'm like, all right, fine. So I gave it like a little twitch with my wrist, you know, like you do to like kind of pop off your fly, you know, cause I mean, I tie, right. So like, there's no trying to get the fly, man. You just pop that thing off and keep rolling. <laughs> so I go to do that. And all of a sudden my line starts to swim away and I'm like, huh, you know, and I look up and my rod is like bent double, you know, and I'm like, that's weird, you know, and I like carp fish a ton with the Tenkara rod. So like, I'm used to feeling a heavy fish on there. So, I was, and so my buddy Kirby turns around and looks at my rod and he goes, dude, what do you got on there? Like, cause he can't tell because he's not used to the flex of the Tenkara rod. He's like, I'm like, oh man, it's a carp. And as soon as I, cause we're, you know, we're fishing this thing. There's high fin carp everywhere. And as soon as I said that, I felt this like, bang 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 head shakes and i was like "Ooh, that's not a carp and he goes no so he comes over and right as he comes over i'm like kind of i'm kind of like playing this fish a little bit and it kind of zigs and i kind of turn it over on side pressure and this thing rolls and it is like a football i mean like like its belly is like the size of a football it's huge you know what i mean like by far the biggest trout i have ever hooked into in my life i'm just like and i look over at my buddy man and he just looks like he's just turns white as a sheet you know and he's like dude don't lose it like he's like freak like he's more excited about this fish than i am you know and i'm just like all right dude well you know like and so the, the fish kind of starts to walk downstream to that other pool and i'm like all right man like i'm gonna have to go with this thing like it's got to be a six or seven pound trout like I've got 4X on that's been getting bounced off the rocks all day. I don't think I've changed my fly in like six hours or even check my tip it. Like, I'm following it. And he's like, you want me to net it? And I'm like, yeah, dude. And so I, you know, I give him my, he grabs the net and he kind of like tries to run around me on the bank, but it's super muddy. So he falls in and like almost hits my rod and me and the line and like the whole nine yards. And I'm like, He's like, oh, my God. He's like, don't lose it. Don't lose it. I'm like, dude, I got it. Like, I'm just going to like, you know, because he has no idea like how fast you can land a big fish with a 10 car rod. You know what I mean? Like those fixed line rods, man, they just they just steer fish like crazy. So this thing starts to go downstream and I'm like, all right, here we go. We're I'm in for a rodeo. And well, for whatever reason, I put just the right amount of pressure on it and the fish literally just turned and just swam right to the bank where he was at. Like so much so that it surprised him. You know, he was just like, what? He, he like, and so he's trying to net the fish and he misses it. 
because it's so muddy, he can't see, right? And he literally almost steps on the fish as he's trying to net it. So he falls over trying to get around this fish. I'm sitting here with this rod, like trying to figure out, okay, well, can I, like, I'm scared to death to hand hand line it because it's this monster. And like, I've never, I've never landed something that big on a barbless hook, you know, like, or if I have, like, it's a carp, like if it gets off, great. I'll just cast another one. Like, this is like kind of a once in a lifetime fish, at least for me. So he stumbles over the fish, he misses it. And I, the, the, the fish literally goes between his legs dang near damn near beaches itself and he nets it like in a cartoon like doesn't scoop it like he literally like drops the net on top of it and it's like traps the fish you know so we both sit there for a second and like the picture that you saw the picture that i sent in is like for this thing is like that's me after like three minutes all the other pictures are like you know, like the fish in the net, like all curled up, you know what I mean? So he's like, he's like, dude, this is, so this kid also too, he's been fishing up in the, in that area his entire life. And he looks over to me first thing, deadpan and goes, dude, I have never in my life seen a brown trout this big pulled out of the Iowa Driftless. And I was like, I mean, I'm sure there has been, but like, it's a really great fish. You know, and just the look on his face and he just like was like almost crying, like high fiving and like it just turned the whole day from like absolute misery into this like five or ten minutes of, ca- you know, five or ten minutes of chaos followed with like unbelievable joy. You know, <laughs> like, oh, my God, I can't believe we got this thing. Like I whenever I tell the story to people, I always like in person, I always say like we caught the fish. You know, because like he was like really part of the experience. It was like amazing, you know. So we get the thing. It's on the bank. It's in there. And now all of a sudden my brain is running like, oh, my, you know, like we have natural reproducing browns up here. Like I got to get this thing back in the water as like quick as humanly possible. Like I I do not want to be that guy, you know, (laughs) like I I want this fish to live. You know, he's in this crammed up in this tiny little, you know, this tiny little creek. So he's like, oh, I got a tape measure. I got a tape measure. And I'm like, dude, like, we'll just put it on in the net. Like, we know it's big. It's totally fine. You know, like, let's just get this. And I was also like scared to death to hold it up because that's all I want is like a 20 plus fish lot fi- picture. <laughs> like, that's, you know, I don't want that. So he puts the net, he puts the tape on it. It's in the net. It's bent like a U. And he goes from tail to nose. I mean, it's literally like bent like a U and it comes up like 19 and a half. And I look at him, I go 20 plus, right? And he's like all day long. And I'm like, okay, cool. So let's get this thing back in. So I put the net in the water. The rod is completely, by the way, it's still to this day has grit on it for where it was buried in that bank. And I've washed it like six times. Um, He, you know, so we get the fish, you know, we snap a couple pictures And to be perfectly honest with you, like I was so elated in that moment and I was so like excited about the fish and just excited to see my friend just completely over the moon about this fish that I don't honestly remember putting it back in the water. I don't remember it swimming away. I don't have any cool like, you know, catch magazine, you know, holding it up with the drips coming off of it and sliding it back in nice and gently. Like I know it went in good and that was it. I mean, it was over. And that was like that weekend. That was, I think normally when we go up there, I mean, the the driftless is really, it's a great fishery. There's like 2000 fish per square mile or something up there. It's like upstream. It's crazy. Um, and that was like the only fish that I caught that day. And it was, I think like one of only like two that I caught the whole trip. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's the story of my nettle infested muddy hike PB brown trout. Oh man. It's hard not to smile after listening to that story. It's one of those fishing outings where anything that could go wrong does go wrong, but in the end it's all worth it. And they definitely landed one heck of a fish. 
Dre was actually lucky to have Kirby there to land that fish and play net man because I couldn't imagine under those circumstances bringing in a fish that big to hand all by yourself. Well, anyway, we're going to kick it out west now and send it to one of my friends that lives in Colorado to tell one of, one of the stories of his memorable fish, another large fish that he tussled with in front of a crowd. I'm Jonathan Antunes. Uh, I live in uh, the Front Range of Colorado, and I uh, fished in Cara here. This was an autumn evening. Uh, probably, I'm going to say that it was in it was in September, and I had fished pretty much the entire the entire afternoon, and got made my way down to this one spot where the river gets really really shallow. And I tend not to skip this spot because I know that there's fish hanging on at least one side of that of that flat area where it's just a bit deeper, but not quite, not quite. It's not, I mean, it's no nowhere near like, to, it's maybe to your knees. And I was uh, fishing with a, um, with a two fly set up with my dropper, which was a uh, cut clip style fly. And behind it, I had a little, uh, almost like a cocky bundy, which is a, you know, um, soft tackle, uh, peacock curl fly, um, pretty small. I was using that one for, for mostly like, you know, the late caddis hatch. We have dark caddis that will hatch like early in the season and then late in the season, they'll start hatching again. And so I was fishing those two together, and I saw some I saw some activity from a from a fish that I I, I didn't really hadn't really seen. Um, usually you can see them in the shallows, but it's it's I, I didn't see this one. He was very well camouflaged, so I made a cast over to him, just kind of working my way towards him, just downstream. Very long line, you know, just kind of bringing it over, tap tapping as I went along. We have what, what that drape is allowing for is that these two flies are just kind of like dancing along the surface. And as I'm bringing it along this, this the current, there is a, I, I don't, I'll never forget this. I'll never, this scene just like replays over and over in my head of this rainbow's head. It had to have been at least, uh, at least an 18 inch or maybe even a 20 inch rainbow, just dolphins out of the water and i see him come out grab the fly in midair and just take it down and as soon as i set the hook man he's going crazy so i'm sitting there fighting this fish and you know over my shoulder i hear these you know i hear you know people talking and i'm kind of you know fighting the fish fighting the fish and i'm kind of maneuvering him into the shallow water trying to keep him out of the real real shallow water because i don't want him to kind of flip over and do that you know get a crazy angle on me and and pop the hook and i see these three guys behind me like you know kind of like watching me like seeing what i'm doing so i'm like oh great i got an audio so <laughs> so the fish you know finally he starts to kind of calm down like he doesn't really have anywhere to go and i just start hand lining him in as i'm hand lining him in like keeping it real low to the water I just see him go and his pop, just that fly just went flying right out of his mouth. I was broken hearted. That was the worst. <laughs> I'll never forget that fish. It was just one of those, you know, it was such a cool take, you know, and I appreciate at least that part, you know, that it was just so awesome to see, you know, a fish really, you know, go for it. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it's one of those fish that you don't forget, and yeah, I'll, I'll I'll never forget that fish. It was a good one. Now, Jonathan is pretty well known for catching some really nice fish, so even though that was the one that got away, I'm sure it doesn't haunt his memories that much. But could you imagine seeing that in person? Just seeing a fish of that size kind of dolphining or porpoising, like he said, and then coming up out of the depths like Jaws to try to take on that fly? That's pretty incredible, and a sight that I feel like you only see in videos, not necessarily on the stream by yourself. 
Well, our hunt for big fish continues, and now we're going to take it over to Tennessee with one of my friends down there who is trying to get his personal best brown after having some good luck with brookies and rainbows. I'm Aaron Kerr. You can find me on Instagram at Appalachian underscore AF. I fish the East Tennessee Cherokee National Forest. Um, been doing fixed line style fishing now for about two years. And I like to fish for a lot of trout and char. Shortly into my uh, little fixed line escapades, so to speak, um, I already kind of ran into my, my big rainbow trout, my big brook trout. Um, but for a long time, the big brown really eluded me. And, uh, you know, I started fishing spinning, uh, moved on to Western fly. And now finally with, uh, Tinkara and other fixed line styles, I, uh, I really started honing in on my skills and learning where and how to search these bigger Browns. Um, kind of an unexpected trip with my, uh, my stepdad and my step grandfather, um, on the South Holston river, uh, pretty close to the Fort Patrick Henry dam. I won't say exactly where, but, uh, Lots of big fish in there. Um, you know, they're, they've got their spinning rods in there. Well, my step grandfather rather is, uh, he's wearing them out. He caught a couple of really nice ones before I actually hooked into anything, but, uh, you know, just drifting my streamer through kind of giving a little pop jig here and there. Um, I, I, I snag is what I thought I did. I'm sitting there holding the rod for a while. Nothing's moving. I'm like, okay, so I start trying to kind of move around, see if I can pull my, my fly loose. Well, then it takes off and uh, kind of got the, the oh crap factor in. Sitting there fighting this fish for 10, 15 minutes with my Wasatch Tinkara Rodzilla and a uh, brown sculpin streamer. Uh, so fighting this fish, fighting this fish, slipping in the mud, falling in holes. Mind you, this is right after the generation had stopped. And everything was just slick and muddy and awful. Um, but we finally get this fish netted. And uh, just this overwhelming sense of relief hit me. Because I couldn't even tell you how many years I had searched for this fish. Um, we don't have an exact measurement. But we're guessing about 26, 27 inches. Uh, so to get that on the fixed line after using reels for a very long time and getting nothing even close to that caliber i think my pb before this was 17 inches so uh quite a wild step up in pbs and it's definitely going to be hard to beat <laughs> yeah that's about it it's just the relief and the sense of accomplishment was incredible that was a pretty cool experience right aaron got to catch that fish in front of family and that kind of made it probably even all the more special what I thought was kind of interesting is Aaron hasn't even been fishing fixed line for all that long. So while those are his big personal best memorable fish that he mentioned, he's probably got a lot more that are going to be coming in the future. And I can't wait to see what he brings in on the end of his line. For our last story, we're going to take it all the way out to Hawaii via Phoenix and talk to a friend that went into the jungles of Waimea Canyon in search of rainbow trout. My name is Adam Trahan. Um, I'm 62. Um, I think I've been fishing Tinkara for 13 years or 14 years. I don't know. Um, I really kind of stopped counting. Um, I was a fly fisherman before that. And um, I really got into fly fishing uh, to quit hang gliding. And hang gliding is something that I used to do in Hawaii uh, when I lived there when I was in the infantry. So it all kind of made sense for me to um, look for trout in uh, the islands. So um, anyway, I had this idea of doing a side trip. My, my family went to uh, the big island. And I was like, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity for me to go and lengthen the vacation. And I went to Kauai for, I gave myself, I think, three days um, to catch those trout. And my family went ahead uh, to the big island, and I was going to meet up with them. Anyway, for about a year 
prior to going, I had decided that, you know, I was going to research it. And there's not much online uh, as far as uh, the trout in Waimea Canyon. Um, it was going to be, uh, it was going to be, a, I was going to have to have a lot of luck to catch those fish because uh, Waimea Canyon is literally one of the rainiest places in the world. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, hopefully I'll get lucky. I can get in between uh, showers and, you know, I, I, hopefully it'll all come together. The stream won't be blown out or, or whatever. I kind of knew what to expect uh, because I had served in the infantry and I had uh, tromped around the jungles uh, on Oahu and the desert and the mountain on Big Island. But Kauai is, is uh, it's a little different. It's really dense jungle, triple canopy in some places. Um, so I started researching it and I took it back to researching about the islands themselves and how uh, desolate they were. And um, from California uh, and um, Japan, and they're just the, the island chain, which is, you know, eight islands and it's about 1500 miles long, uh, but it's like 35 and 3,800 miles from, uh, it's one of the, it is the most desolate island chain uh, on planet earth and this rainiest place. So I, I'm just um, thinking to myself, okay, how am I gonna do this? I gave myself three days cause it's kind of costly um, and we were already going to Hawaii, uh, and I found uh, a youth hostel that was like 30 bucks a night, literally. And uh, so I saved some money there, um, uh, communal showers, uh, bathrooms, that sort of thing. I just needed a place to crash and uh, take a shower. But I got there, um, and... Uh, the weather was good. Uh, there's always clouds at the top of the mountain. There, it's it's an it's in the interior of the island, at the near the the peak of the the old volcano that created it. Uh, got my rental car, kind of settled in, and the next morning got up before sunrise, and I think it was about an hour drive to get up there, and uh, no clouds, so super happy, and. Um, uh, backstory is they had um, stocked the headwater streams of Waimea Canyon back in the 20s. They brought 50,000 um, eggs from, I believe it was Montana, and they brought them to Honolulu. And this is in the 20s. So then they brought the eggs from... Honolulu to Kauai and there's a hatchery there and they they hatched out the fry and then that's what they stock those headwater streams and there's about a half a dozen streams up there that have uh, trout in them so uh, that's the backstory but anyway I, I'm driving up the mountain and I get to a place uh, at the top called Kokii and that's where kind of a naturalist museum about the flora and the fauna. And I had done all my uh, work um, like any internet fisherman would do with uh, Google Earth and researching and contacting the two other uh, sources that I had found for the uh, trout of Kauai. They were pretty tight-lipped about uh, which streams had them, um, but they gave some good information. But I kind of figured it out and I had uh, maps stowed on my iPhone and I used Gaia, uh, the, the mapping um, service, which you can really uh, detail a lot of where you're hiking, the breadcrumb trail, the, the pictures, and took off from Kokii and it was supposed to be about a two mile hike to uh, where the first stream was. I was gonna try to fish two streams. And from Google Earth, the road that I was gonna take was across the jungle and kind of downhill. 
but what ended up happening is it looked kind of like a road but once you got in 50 yards into this dense jungle uh you were hot tired muggy soaking wet from just the humidity and from the rain from you know before the rainforest basically and um so i pushed on i was following my gps and man i knew i had screwed up because i was uh i was decided to take you know go across the jungle instead of like taking a hiking down the road so anyway i got about halfway through and uh, got into a clearing and i'm taking pictures and all this kind of stuff and uh regrouped it was an area where i could uh you know basically just think about what i was doing i didn't want to go back i was halfway across the river so to speak i didn't want to swim halfway back so i pushed on following my gps and i popped out and then i could see a gal in a truck four-wheel drive truck with a couple of surfboards in the back and i was like oh my god i could have driven here so it was kind of funny so i started, kept walking down the road and I, and I got to my stream and uh it was coffee colored tainted and hawaii's got some wicked plants and uh i had worn like the equivalent of like uh water shoes because i knew i was just going to be soaked and um hopped off the road and started hiking down to the stream. It wasn't that far. Um, I was using uh, a rod that uh, Daniel from Tenkara USA had given me, uh, the Hane. And um, I was, I, you know, I could have chosen one of the rods that I liked, but it, this was kind of like the adventure rod when that, when it was coming out. And I wanted to do that for Daniel. And um, so, Pulled the rod out, stretched it out, stretched my line out. Um, and then, like, I think it was the first cast, I saw a, a fish turn on my fly. And I was using my uh, uh, my variation of the uh, Sakasa Kabari. And uh, I kept getting these short strikes. And I was like, holy Toledo, you know, what's going on with me? So I'd made it all this way. I was super tired. I knew I had to get back. It was it was sunny out, uh, but it was super hot, and um, I finally caught my fish. Uh, and then it was you know six inches or something like that, pretty small. Uh, it was a, a rainbow, you know, like a wild rainbow, naturally reproducing from that original stocking in uh, 1920. They don't stock it uh, anymore; they're all wild. And caught another. Caught about I don't know maybe four or six trout I, I it really does, didn't matter uh because i just caught him got my picture and then decided well i'm gonna head back and i and i did and i followed the road this time and uh it was longer and then i actually got a ride from uh not the same gals but another gal in a in a pickup truck back to Kokii, and i had caught my trout on the first uh day basically um and then just took pictures and drove back down to um town and um i my favorite there's a there's a uh, my favorite bar uh the lava lava is in um where i was staying um near poipu and i just went and got myself a drink and then finished up uh, my story uh, that I had kind of written um, all along, and uh, that was it. That's probably uh, my most uh, memorable trout, and that would be even over trout that I've caught in uh, Japan uh, because I really kind of figured it out. When I was, uh, when I, I've, I've been to Japan a couple of times and fished all over there, but basically I was taken there by, um, by my uh, friends, and but in Kauai, I figured it out pretty much on my own. So now I don't know about you. I didn't even realize there were rainbow trout in Hawaii. 
And listening to Adam's story, I thought it was so funny that he did all that bushwhacking only to find out that he could have driven to the spot that he was trying to reach. Anyway, if you enjoyed that story, um, Adam did mention that he had written an article when he was telling it. And you can check out that article on TankaraFisher.com. Well, I guess it wouldn't be a Fish Stories podcast if I didn't tell my own story. So I hope you'll bear with me for another minute or two as I kind of run through my memorable fish story. And it only happened last year. It was actually the last day of about a three or four day trip out to Wisconsin. And, you know, everybody knows when you've been doing fishing for quite a few days in a row, you know, by the end of the day, you're still by the end of the trip, you're still excited to fish. But, you know, you're probably not, you know, checking off all the boxes as you should, um, you know, or as you do earlier in the trip. So as I kind of drove up to the, to, the, to the trailhead that I was going to hike to go fish the water that I wanted to, I just grabbed my pack, not really paying attention to what rods were in it or what sort of gear was, was stowed inside, and kind of made my way down to the stream where it had been raining the past couple days, kind of off and on, off and on. So the water was up and it was a little bit faster than normal, but still very fishable. It wasn't chocolate milk or anything like that. So when I went to go string up my rod and go fishing, I noticed that I had only had small rods on me. Um, so I grabbed the 320 centimeter Nishin Royal Stage, which is a 6'4 rod, which quite honestly is probably not the rod I would have chose to fish this water. You have the opportunity to get into some bigger fish down here. And um, it was just the best choice of the rods that I happened to have. So that's what I went with. And for most of the afternoon, it was fine. You know, I was catching fish in maybe the 10 to 12 inch range, lots of brown trout that would put up a pretty good fight, but you know, nothing that that rod couldn't handle. Um, it was actually kind of a pleasurable day of fishing. The rain had kind of subsided. It was getting sunny. It was just turning into a really, really nice day. So, you know, being the last day of the trip, I kind of had a an ending time in my head. I was only going to fish until maybe two or three o'clock and then kind of pack things up and get things ready for the trip back home. Um, and so I was reaching the last pool and this pool was not very wide, but it was probably narrow and deep. You could see that there was a lot of underwater structure, a lot of rocks, some down timber, things like that. And you could just see like a little bit of that white water. If you've ever fished in the area that I'm talking about, most of the water looks relatively flat. Um, but this area, there was definitely some underwater structure that was causing some riffles and some, some white water up top. So again, long last day of a pretty long trip, I kind of just absentmindedly threw my fly into that, into that white water. And then all of a sudden, my rod just bent in half. I swear that little Nishin Royal stage bent all the way down to the cork handle. And what ended up happening was I had a pretty large brown trout on. It wasn't the biggest brown trout that I've ever caught, but on that rod and in that fast water and in those conditions, um, it was definitely a memorable fight. I had to do all I could steering the rod against the way it wanted to go, letting it, giving it some slack, making sure I didn't, you know, stress the tip it, keeping my power curve on, you know, all those things that people talk about when you're fighting big fish. I had to get every little trick out of the textbook. I ran up and down the bank trying not to trip on rocks um, or logs or things like that. And finally, after what seemed like it was an hour, it was probably only, you know, maybe two minutes at most. I seemed to be able to control that fish and bring it into the shallows and into my net. And while it wasn't, like I said, a giant fish or the biggest fish I ever caught, it was about a 16 inch brown, 16 or 17 inch brown. And on that Nishin Royal stage, it just overpowered that rod and really, really made it quite a memorable fight and a memorable fish. One that was a perfect way to close out that trip, making it all the more pleasurable experience as I look back on it today. Well, that concludes this episode of the Tenkara Angler Level Line podcast. I wanted to thank all of our guests who came on and told their very memorable and entertaining fish stories. If you were entertained and like what you heard, I do promise that we'll have some more episodes of the Tenkara Angler Level Line podcast coming out in the future. So be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube for the video version. Until then, tight lines and good luck on the water. 